The session on urban design and planning examined the role of urban design practices and concepts before, during, and after epidemics, and the factors that shaped and codified each and their longer term implications for urban design, urban life, and the natural environment. Our discussant today is Richard Jackson. Richard Joseph Jackson is Professor Emeritus at the Fielding School of Public Health at the University of California, Los Angeles, where he was department chair in environmental health science. A pediatrician, he has served in many leadership positions uh, with, the California, uh, with the California Health Department, including the highest as a state health officer. Uh, officer. For nine years, he was director of the CDC's Nation, uh, National Center for Environmental Health and received the Presidential Distinguished Service Award. In October 2019, he was elected to the National Academy of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Jackson was instrumental in establishing the California Birth Defects Monitoring Program and in the creation of health and national laws to reduce risks from pesticides, especially to farm workers and to children. While at CDC, he established major environmental public health programs and instituted the federal effort to biomonitor chemical levels in the US population. He has received a HERO Award from the Breast Cancer Fund, Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Public Health Law Association and from the, the New Partners for Smart Growth, the John Hines Award for National, uh, and the John Hines Award for National Leadership in the Environment. Uh, in 2015, he received the Henry Pope Reed Award for his contributions to architecture. Dr. Jackson has co-authored the books, uh, Urban Sprawl and uh, Public Health, Making Healthy Places and uh, Designing Healthy Communities for which he has hosted a four-hour PBS series. He is an elected honorary fellow of American Institute of Architects and elected honorary fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects. He lectures widely across multiple disciplines and has testified before the US Congress and California legislature many times. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mohammed, And it's a pleasure to be with you and Caitlin and, and all the participants in this wonderful conference. Um, I really enjoyed the five prior talks and I learned a great deal. I've been asked to offer some thoughts from these presentations along with the insights that I gained from my 40 years of work as a physician, pediatrician, epidemiologist, and public health leader. Carlo Trombino's excellent presentation reflected on Palermo's response to the plague epidemic of 1576 in Sicily. He calls our attention to the text from that time entitled Information de Pestifero, authored by Filippo Ingresio. Importantly, it has many lessons for today. At that time, the city leaders convened something virtually unknown, a science task force, and put in place public health interventions, including the establishment of quarantine and the building of temporary hospitals. The second vignette by Andrew Wells was about the plague outbreaks of the years 1665-66, and it focused on the city of Bristol in Southwest Britain. He reflected on the leadership by the city magistrates, including the quarantine, exclusion of visitors, and the restriction on the movement of persons and goods, particularly from London. Of interest to me as a public health physician was not only the construction of hospitals, but that parklands were requisitioned to provide locations for them. In today's world, we think of parks as places of play, nature contact, and socializing. But during epidemics, and disasters, they can be used as important locations for recovery and short-term clinical care. Irina Davidovici's presentation examined epidemics of cholera in London in the 1850s. Dr. John Snow's work is foundational in epidemiology. During a devastating the devastating epidemic, Snow used case finding and mapping to identify the source of illnesses and deaths, namely, the contaminated water from the Broad Street pump. 
Later reports on the cholera outbreaks capture the links between the prevalence of disease and the conditions of the built environment. In this case, the dense squalid housing for the impoverished. And one term that was used for this is rookery. This word's unfamiliar to us Americans. We do not call our aggressive, smart, messy, and yes, black crows, rooks, and their crowded habitation rookeries. The linking of these animals to bad housing, a rookery is informative in many ways. Some of them are unfortunate. Dr. Davidovici critiques the historical linking that those with wealth are morally superior. This prejudice endures, in fact, it's amplified, for example, by Donald Trump. The linking of poverty, disease, and moral degradation creates a durable and dangerous triad, a near unbreakable iron triangle that is embedded in self-serving political beliefs. Susan Burns of the University of Chicago examined the history of cholera in the city of Edo in Japan, which was renamed Tokyo after the fall of the shogunate in 1868. The government at that time was sensitive to the political danger of failing to manage epidemics effectively. It built quarantine hospitals, often on public lands, but the public viewed such places with suspicion. Many of the city dwellers believed that the sick were better off at home. Professor Burns reflected on how epidemics make evident the social fissures in a society and adds that this persists today. As with other speakers, she makes evident the link between disease and stigma. The fifth presentation was by Nicole de la Luvia, who, opened, who offered insights on the history and control of malaria on the island of Mauritius. This island in the Indian Ocean had a sequence of colonial overlords, including the Dutch, French, and British. Malaria became endemic in that population after the arrival of enslaved Africans who were compelled to work on sugar plane sugarcane plantations. In fact, the creation, the creation of the plantations amplified the mosquito population and the spread of the disease. In 1865, an astonishing 12% of the entire population died of malaria. It was not until 1897 that Dr. Ronald Ross discovered that mosquitoes were the disease vector. In the early 1900, mosquito populations declined through the drainage of marshes and by the mid-century through the use of insecticides. In America, redlining on real estate maps was used to determine suitability for mortgage loans and de facto to show where blacks were unwelcome and could not qualify for mortgages. In an act of disease-focused redlining, rather than merely economic, the so-called McGregor line was devised for Mauritius. This was a line encircling the island's mountain at about 1,000 feet, above which the risk of malaria was thought to be lower. So at this point, I want to offer a few of my own summary thoughts. As we saw in the first talk, the frontispiece of Ingresio's 1576 book on the plague in Palermo captured some of the past approaches for control of an epidemic. This four-part illustration showed the following elements. On the top left, auto, gold. On the top right, fuoco, fire. In the center, justicia, justice. And on the bottom, forca. And you know, I'm given to transliteration. I thought forca meant force. In a way it does. It means gallows, the site, hanging sites. And it was surrounded by instruments of torture. So the center illustration is of Lady Justice. It's a medallion which is circumscribed in Latin with the words, Justicia in sese virtutes continent omnes. Justice contains all virtues. I find this model and theme to be useful for my own thoughts now offered from the vantage point of the year 2020. To effectively confront an epidemic requires each of the named elements, finances, hygiene, population management, and justice that includes the virtues of honesty, mercy, and charity. The illustration also has an important omission, namely the importance of science. First, thinking about oil, gold, wealth, 
substantial economic resources. Epidemics bring death not only to people, but to enterprises and to organizations. Epidemics are expensive. A lesson COVID-19 teaches us today. The top right corner of the frontispiece has the inscription Fuoco for fire. It represents the need for hygiene, in this case, aggressive and effective disease and pest eradication measures. In the 16th century, the Yersinia pestis bacillus and the importance of infected fleas and rats as the cause of the disease were unknown. I attempted to read small portions of the Italian text and I was impressed by the excellence of Ingressio's clinical descriptions. Many of the clinical terms Ingressio used in his careful observations 450 years ago are accurate today and much of his medical vocabulary is still used in clinical medicine. It was not until the late 19th and the first half of the 20th century that science and medicine offered essential bacteriologic, virologic, antiseptic, physiologic, and other insights. And before that time, doctors did more harm than good. We, admit, we physicians admit this with embarrassment. Filippo Ingresio's environmental directives, however, were more helpful than his clinical ones. In confronting epidemics, population health needs have remained much the same with the exception of scientifically based improvements. Here I, be here I believe are the messages from me and for other public health and architectural leaders in the 21st century. Governments must be prepared to provide one, fundamental personal survival necessities, such as food, water, shelter, trauma protection, and removal of the dead. In large emergencies, this requires outside help. In fact, the definition of a disaster is an event so serious and widespread that recovery without external assistance is impossible. And back to Oro, to gold, the economic impacts also make necessary outside funds, including grants and low cost loans. And where there are devastating human losses, for example, of parents of young children, governments must provide support. Also, governments must assure some modicum of nursing care, often with hospitals and important in this protection of, and important in this is the protection of the, in the hospital of the personnel who they themselves must remain functional and do not become disease spreaders. And governments must enforce public health laws, for example, related to the disposal of wastes, especially human wastes, and the provision of safe food and water. Governments must maintain social and public orders. Victims of disaster and epidemics are highly vulnerable to physical assault, theft, and other harms. And government must present misallocation of resources used for the control and recovery. For example, assuring that the recovery funds are not directed to private economic interests of the magistrate or to the president's uh, son-in-law. They need to go out to the people that really need it. And Ingressio and others did not have the benefit of scientific advances, including chemical controls and pharmaceutical therapies developed over the last 140 years. These include disinfection, pesticides, antibiotics, and vaccines. And as science is advanced, we need our culture to advance as well. Namely, the need for sensitive addressing of the inevitable amplification of the economic and social disparities and the accompanying stigmatization of ill populations along lines of income, social class, and race. We need to put an end to that iron triangle. And I have one additional suggestion that extends more broadly. In the 21st century, governments must be prepared to address threats considered to be, quote, acts of God. For example, wildfires and floods and droughts and cyclones. Yet with climate change and planetary heating resulting from the carbonization of, atmos of the atmosphere, many of these fall into the second category, human-made threats. And these include chemical, biological, 
and nuclear agents that can be used as instruments of terror. Specifically, humanity now possesses the scientific ability to synthesize pandemic creating agents. Increasingly, governments must develop the capacity to address many threats, not simply those of the past. No longer can we think about dangers one at a time. Preparedness must confront a panoply of threats. Nations need to be able to address all hazards with accelerated research, robust communication systems, nimble access to resources, and competent leadership. And construction of human habitation must address this apocalyptic range of hazards. Thank you for the invitation to join you all.